this week on Capital Report. This is a 25 cent tax cut at the pump for a lot of people who got hit hard. Is this the week we celebrate the gas tax cut in Connecticut? Safe to say negotiations are still ongoing. Oh yes, a yes, absolutely. Plus, creating new rules for absentee ballot access. From sickness or, or physical disability. This is my ninth sick day this semester. It's getting pretty tough coming up with new illnesses. Could moms be the secret to winning the governor's race in 2022? Moms are the problem solvers in the households. Hey, Mom! The meatloaf! We want it now! The meatloaf! And speaking of the governor's race, why haven't we seen a Republican candidate for lieutenant governor? I don't know. <laughs> Time to find some answers. Capital Report starts now. Welcome to Capital Report. I am Tom Dutchick, and we are so glad you're spending part of this Sunday morning alongside the panel, our own Jeff Spicoli. Joe Anderson was Democratic, former Speaker of the Connecticut House of Representatives. Hey, if I'm Spicoli, you're Mr. Hand. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Johnny McKinney, Republican, former Senate Minority Leader, big Fast Times guy. Yeah, still sad from the Yukon loss, but uh, those mm. clips by our producer cheering me up. All right, guys, John's on fire. So last Monday, Governor Lamont announced he plans to put money back into the pockets of Connecticut drivers and offer a 25 cent per gallon tax break. Six days later, we are in like what we need to call here in Calpar, hurry up and wait mode. Lawmakers are pretty much all in agreement this can happen, that the math works and Connecticut drivers deserve some relief at the pump, but there are still I's to dot and T's to cross on this plan. Gas suppliers have raised concerns about how this impacts their bottom line, and the industry is looking for protections as well. Democratic leaders on their part say they're working on it. You know they are. Watch this. I mean, there remains a concern that the whatever we do is actually going to be passed on to the consumer. Um, so certainly we believe in trying to provide some relief uh, to drivers and Connecticut taxpayers. We also have to work with retailers to ensure that that price, that that savings gets passed along to the consumer. One sticking point that was brought up this past week is that the excise tax cut on gasoline would not apply to diesel. Senate Minority Leader says he'd like to see that happen. McKinney's shaking his head, but he wants to get the first part of this across the finish line this Wednesday, he says. Watch this. What we're looking at doing is making sure that that agreement, which will reduce gas prices by a quarter, uh, we're going to have a, a sales tax holiday and, and bus rides, that we get to vote on that by next Wednesday the 23rd. Let's First things first, let's get that across the finish line and then we can look at the other issues. Now we have McKinney and Air Simwitz on during these trying times because Joe was the guy cutting those deals. What do you hear? What's going to happen this week? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen. I will say the governor and the legislators did do the right thing. They got together. They talked about it. They came out with an agreement. I think my fear is that uh, other interests are going to come into play. Um, this is something that needs to be done immediately. I understand what Jason is saying, uh, Representative Rojas, and you do want to make sure it goes to the consumer. But this cannot become a Christmas tree where everybody else is, you know, we called it a Christmas tree when we were there, John, where everybody else's wants, they figure they have the opportunity to get it. Do this. You still have another month and a half to session. You'll have a lot of time to do other things. You can move your priorities forward. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and Joe and I spent a couple of times negotiating okay. stuff together. Um, and I kind of think we would have gotten this done already. But uh, first, number one, in 2012, I think it was, Joe, we passed a new law regarding price gouging. Yeah. So the Attorney General, Attorney General Tong, has the power and authority to make sure that whatever cut is made will be transferred to consumers, mm -hmm. and I have faith that he will do that. Um, I do think not cutting the diesel, diesel tax is a mistake. I don't think that's part of the Christmas tree. Look, your your blue collar workers, right? Your mm -hmm. your electricians, your plumbers, they need relief, and they're driving for their business uh, trucks that use diesel. So I think we ought to reduce that. Uh, but you're right. I'm hearing that uh, maybe the Senate Democrats want to do their permanent EITC, the Earned Income Tax Credit fix, and, and other things in this. That's a mistake. Those are budget items that go into next year. This is about relief between now and July 1st, and, and it should be limited to that. And I, I didn't hear that, that the EITC was the sticking point, but that's an issue I feel very comfortable that stands on its own merits. That's a good discussion to have, and we can talk about the economic impact when we did it before. We talked about what, you know, the people that get the EITC, that money comes in and it immediately goes out. It is an economic driver. 
But so, a standalone, right? Standalone. Yep. Yeah. It's a great argument to have. Don't you don't have to put it onto the Christmas yeah. tree. Okay, so did you know that a sickness and an illness are two different things? When it comes to getting an absentee ballot in Connecticut, state lawmakers certainly think so. The House passed a bill last week that changes that language and the difference wording allows for more Connecticut voters to qualify for absentee ballot access. Opens the door for something like well, COVID to be used as an excuse for a voter absentee. Watch this. You may not personally have an illness, right? But the sickness of COVID, of COVID, right, which kind of permeates through society, could endanger the person you're caring for. And I think that's kind of the situations we're looking at. I think generally the people that oppose it are concerned um, about debacles down the road of the state mailing out absentee ballots to every household using inactive lists. So I think we're going to see a lot of debate revolving around how this statute is actually going to be applied versus. Um, the law itself. No, illness and sickness. Learn something new every day on Cap Report, Joe, huh? Yeah, um, I understand where they want him to go. Uh, uh, John and I happen to be on the same page with no excuse, absentee ballot. That's really what we should do. I understand that the political issues of trying to get that passed led them down the road to this. It was good to see them act in a bipartisan way and move the bill along. We want more people to vote in the state of Connecticut. We want more people to vote everywhere. Yeah, I think this is just common sense, and it was overwhelmingly bipartisan. A uh, few Republicans voted no. Um, but. You know, clearly this pandemic is with us for a long time. So yeah, so if someone in your household has COVID, you shouldn't be going to a polling place. Uh, you should be able to use absentee ballots. But what's the stumbling block, John, towards no excuse voting? I, I don't know, Tom, to be honest with you. Um, I, I think there's a Trump effect here. Uh, there was a time when Larry Cafaro was the House Republican leader. I was the Senate Republican yeah. leader. And all Republicans voted for and proposed uh, uh, an amendment for no excuse absentee ballot voting. It wasn't passed, but I think we should do it in Connecticut. Yeah, remember what happened is I, I think it was it passed the chambers, but it was amended in different years. Um, part of our nuanced laws in the state of Connecticut, if you're going to amend the Constitution, it has to pass by a certain number amount in one session, or it's got to pass two consecutive sessions. Right. Because there, and there is a ballot measure this this fall. There is, but it is. you can do no excuse absentee ballot without amending the Constitution, which is why I favored it because yeah. I think amending the Constitution is difficult and should be rare. Um, but. Look, people vote by absentee because sometimes they have to, um, and they don't necessarily have a sickness, but maybe they're working and they're not sure they're going to get home in mm -hmm. time. So I just think it makes common sense. Now, should we mail everyone an absentee ballot? Should there be absentee ballot harvesting? I'm, I'm nervous about those and don't think we should go that far. But yes, everybody should have the right to vote by absentee. All right, guys, so when the legislative, when the legislative session began, we knew that tackling juvenile crime was going to be a top priority for lawmakers and Governor Lamont. Public Safety Commissioner is heaping high praise on the gov for his bill that tackles juvenile crime and illegal guns calls for 72 and a half million dollars for public safety improvements governor lamont also sees youth intervention programs as a critical component for stopping crime before it starts watch this follow the example of the police athletic league follow the example of ice to be follow the example of project longevity Follow all the programs we hand to give each and every one of our young people the very best opportunity. You give them the very best opportunity in life, something to believe in, and they know that they have somebody who believes in them. That's how we'll take care of crime. And when it comes to juvenile crime, there's still a rift between Democrats and Republicans with regard to violent crime and incarceration. However, GOP leaders say that is just one piece of how to tackle a bigger problem. Watch this. They need to start focusing on the big picture rather than trying to discredit the positions that we have because I really don't feel that throwing money at the situation is good enough. It's not going to solve the problem and we really need to look at our laws, give the courts more discretion, give our police officers more discretion in order to protect these children, make sure they're getting the services they need. But at times, if they are dangerous to themselves or the public, they should have the discretion to hold those children longer. Hey Mac, through these discussions we've had about this issue, you've always thought there are common sense approaches to this and that should, they should be done immediately. Well, there are, and I'm frustrated, uh, Joe, that now some of the debate is turning into, well, Republicans just want to throw people back in jail. Um, and that's, and if you just listen to the House Republican leader, Vin Candelora, clearly that's not what they're saying. But, but I think there is some merit to the fact that at some point there are crimes that are so violent that there needs to be accountability, and sometimes that count, accountability is detention. Mm -hmm. um, but clearly there are a lot of programs 
um, that we can use models out there uh, that can try to help prevent these crimes before they happen and give the, the young people who are committing these offenses the help that they need so that they will stop going down this road. Yeah, and, and I think the governor uh, actually got the, the legendary hole in one on that, but there needs to be more. Talking about the intervention services early, um, we need to spend more time. There are many organizations out here in the state of Connecticut that are doing very good work and intervening and getting involved early, uh, supporting young men and young women around the state. We have we have young women in the state of Connecticut, 14 years old, that, that have children and have no place to go and they get in an abusive situation with a boyfriend. Those are all violent situations too. At some point, we need to incarcerate individuals. But what do we do once we're incarcerating them? Are we providing them the services? Are we, are, we're, we're, hopefully we're just not teaching them to be better criminals because that's what they're around. Are they getting the opportunity to learn a trade? Are they gonna be employable when they come out? Do they complete their education? It has to be a holistic view. And you're right, I've talked to Vinny about this subject before. Vinny's heart's in the right place. He wants to do something, he wants to prevent the crimes, but he's not a throw him in a uh, cell and throw away the well, kind of Well, listen, if the governor got a hole in one, he owes us all around, so let's go. <laughs> all right, guys, so how to reverse Connecticut's flat population growth? The think tank has some answers. When Kevin Power returns, we'll talk to one of the brains behind this from the Yankee Institute and why all this matters when we get back, don't go away.